I love that word reconciled. It's a powerful word right there. You know what that word reconciled means? It means to settle a disagreement. It means to cause to go it coexist in harmony. And isn't this what the Christmas season is really truly all about? Now, the reality is there was much more than just a small, minor disagreement between God and man. There is a great divide, an an insurpassable divide. God is holy. He's just. He is righteous. Sinners can't even enter into his presence. And we're the exact opposite of that. We are guilty and broken and condemned sinners. And there's absolutely nothing that you and I could ever do to save ourselves. There's nothing that we could ever do about our sin. We have failed. We are condemned before a holy, righteous God. But I'm thankful that God did something about it. He sent his son, Jesus, who was born for one reason and one reason alone, and that was to go to a cross, to die because the penalty for sin was death. And on the cross, he took your place, he took my place. And when I put my faith and trust in him as my savior, I am reconciled. Everything is made new. God and man can dwell together in harmony. What an incredible truth. What an incredible message. Now, If we can coexist in harmony with God, considering who and what we are, then I promise you, I promise you beyond a shadow of a doubt that when we come to promises and guarantees and securities and gifts, like the one that we're going to be looking at here this morning in Romans, I promise you, you can believe it to be true in your life. Y'all realize what we just got done reading a few minutes ago in our scripture reading? Romans 8, 28, we're talking about probably the Mount Everest of all promises in God's word. Let's say it out loud together. You can put it up on the screen, Romans 8, 28. But let's, let's say this one more time and let the truth of this sink in this morning. It says this, and we, help me out here, ready, here we go. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And we know that some things, a few things, we know that all things work together for good to them who love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. Did you know this morning that God shows himself to us just as miraculously as he did to the people of the Christmas story? Did you realize that this morning? Now, let's review for just a minute. When, when God showed up and told Mary that she was going to give birth to his only begotten son, how did, he sh- how did he reveal that news to her? He sent her a what? Yep, you all help me out here this morning, okay? He sent her a? He sent her an angel. That's exactly right. And then when his son was born, man, on that, that Christmas morning or that Christmas Eve years and years ago, 2,000 years ago, when his son was born, the shepherds were out in the field and they were watching over their sheep. And guess what appeared to them to tell them that God's son was born? It was once again. And then when the wise men found out about the birth of Jesus, how did God show himself to them? Nope, not angels. Okay, I tricked you on that one. I set you guys up good for that one right there. No, how did he reveal himself to the wise men? A star, that's exactly right. He put a star in the sky. Now, we'll come back to that in a little bit as we work through the message this morning, but he put a star in the sky. But how in the world did the wise men know that the star represented the birth of the Messiah? How in the world did the wise men know that they were going to leave and travel hundreds of miles to the place where Jesus was born. And do you know what the answer to that is? They knew that because they knew God's word. They knew that in the book of Daniel. These were most likely magi from from Babylon. In the same tradition of what what Daniel was, when Nebuchadnezzar, when the kings, um, Cyrus, and those called on the the soothsayers, and the magicians, and the wise men uh, from Babylon, and Daniel was part of that group, These magi were probably from that same area, from that same group thousands of years later. And in Daniel chapter 9, God laid out a timeline of how things would come. And it was around that time. You know what these wise men were doing? They were searching and looking for the Messiah. 
There was a promise made back in the book of Numbers that a star would come out of Jacob. And all of a sudden, as they're looking and they're searching, they see a star. They're astrologers. They saw a star that they had never seen before. And they knew that the Messiah was born. And they knew all of this because they knew the truth of God's word. The best thing in all the world that you and I can do is believe the truth of God's word. Because when we believe the truth of God's word, you know what God's going to do? He's going to reveal himself to us in miraculous and real and tangible ways. And you know what? You're more than likely not going to run into an angel on your way home today. And he probably is not going to show up to you tonight. But can I tell you that when you believe the truth of God's word and you bank on it and you believe promises like what we're going to look at this morning and we know that all things will work together for good, then whatever is broken in your life, whatever situation feels impossible, do you understand this morning that God is going to deliver on his promise over and over and over again in miraculous and real and tangible ways, and you can experience the presence of God? That's what Christmas is all about. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Now, All season long, we've been unwrapping gifts. And if you've been here, you probably noticed that the big box is not on the stage this morning. And the reason why is because we're going to do something a little bit different today. We're going to learn from the gifts that the wise men brought to Jesus. And we're going to learn what we can give to him. As we go into one of the greatest celebrations, as we we look at this holiday which has one of the most magnificent truths, that God became flesh. Man, there ought to be a heart response that comes from every single one of us in here of what we can truly present back to our King and our Lord and our Savior. So if you know anything about the wise men, what were the three gifts that they brought to Jesus? They brought gold and myrrh. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So we're going to start with gold. I got me a bag of gold right here. How many of you would love to open up your stocking and find one of these things in there? You'd be really disappointed because it's plastic and it's only worth about $15. But imagine if this was real. Man, imagine if this was a bag of, of real gold. Hey, gold has always been a highly valued commodity. Accumulation of gold is one of the chief measures of wealth. If you have a lot of gold, real gold, you got a lot of money. You got a lot of wealth. You got a lot of power and clout in this world. Because of its scarcity, because of its immense value, gold was particularly associated with royalty or nobility. For whatever reason, rich people like to help other rich people get even richer. If you look through the Bible, even uh, Solomon, for instance, one of the wisest men that ever lived on the face of this earth, the Queen of Sheba came to visit him because she had heard about his wisdom. And you know what she brought to him? She brought to him large amounts of gold and all kinds of other gifts. And so you know what a gift was that was very fitting for a king? Gold. It's something that you would present and take to a king. And the wise men understood who they were seeking and searching for. They were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for God in the flesh. They were looking for the King of kings and Lord of lords. And you know what this gold represents this morning? This gold represents incomparable majesty. Incomparable majesty. Now look at how this plays out in our verse this morning. Verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. This promise is based on the most rock-solid perspective of reality. If you were here last week, you'll understand that we were celebrating, man. We were opening up gifts. We talked about how when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you are adopted into his family. We talked about the fact that we are joint heirs with Jesus. We are children of the King of kings and Lord of lords. And there was an interesting little phrase just a few verses before we got to this point. It says, and you will be joint heirs with Jesus if so be that you suffer with him. If so be that you suffer with him. This verse does not present some sort of a fairy tale life. I'm not here to tell you this morning that if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're going to be rich and you're going to be prosperous and all of your problems are going to be solved. And man, life is just going to be a dream come true all the way till the day that you die and step into the presence of Jesus. Because that's not what the Bible promises us. 
The Bible promises us the truth. There will be suffering. Before there's glory, there's going to be suffering because we live in a broken world. I have no doubt in my mind that many of you in here have probably had a really hard time trying to find the Christmas spirit this year. Maybe you're even here at church this morning because you're hoping for some sort of a a breakthrough, some sort of hope, some sort of something to turn around maybe the darkness or the cloud because of the reality of the things of life that you're experiencing and that you're going through. Just because it's Christmas doesn't mean that the problems and the pain of this life stops, right? In this world, there will be suffering. Terrible things will happen. But know this, all Things will work together for good. Hey, this promise is not only based on the most rock-solid perspective of reality, but it's also for those who love God. Do you love God? Do you love God this morning with all of your heart, your soul, and your mind, and your strength? Because can I tell you something this morning? God loves you. God loves you with an indescribable and incomparable love. He loves you enough that he wants to work all things for good in your life. And if that's not enough of assurance for you, look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. Go ahead and put that up on the screen. Look at what this verse says. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them. Everybody, those last three words out loud. That love him. Do you see the truth that we're looking at right there? I have not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man. You can't even begin to possibly imagine all of the good things that God has in store, all of the good things that God has prepared for you. If you love him, I want to challenge you this morning. Make sure that you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Make sure that you have the same type of attitude that the wise men had who were seeking and searching and looking for Christ in everything, because if you're doing that, you're going to find him, and he's going to deliver on his promises. But there's more to it than that, because this promise isn't just for those who love God. This promise is for those who are called, and called according to his purpose. There is a general call that goes out, and that call has been going out all morning. It started when we were singing, God rest you, merry gentlemen, joy to the world. Man, there was a powerful call that went out in the picture of baptism. 13 people following the Lord in baptism. A picture of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Man, Vicky's song that she just sung about being reconciled to God. We are sinners. God is holy and just. There was a payment that was made on the cross. There is a call that is going out all Christmas season long. If you know the true meaning of the season and you know it's about the birth of Jesus, there's a call that is going out. We were in desperate need of a savior and Jesus is the savior. And this morning that call is going out loud and clear. God is calling you to put your faith and trust in Jesus. But this call is more than just that generic general call. Man, this call is like the call to Lazarus in the grave. Jesus was standing at the grave of one of his closest friends on earth. Lazarus, he'd been dead four days. The Bible says that his body already was stinking by that time. And he's standing at that grave, and you know what he says? Lazarus, come forth. And guess what happened? Lazarus came forth. Man, he walked right out of that grave, grave clothes on and everything. What an awesome sight that was to behold. The call of God is a call that is powerful enough to produce what he says it's going to produce. And you know what the call of God is? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Man, when you put your faith in Jesus, you were saved. You were delivered from an eternity in hell. You were delivered from your own brokenness and your own sin. And you were saved. You became a brand new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. That's the call that we're talking about. It's a call that you must respond to. It's not enough just to say that you love the Lord your God. You've got to respond in a personal way to that call. And when you do, God makes you brand new. No promise 
surpasses the magnificence and magnitude of this promise. Incomparable majesty is at work for you. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're talking about a savior that is powerful enough that spoke this world into existence with just a word. We're talking about a savior who worked inside the heart of a Roman emperor and got him to issue a decree so that at just the right time, when Mary was going to have her baby, her and Joseph had to travel 70 miles to the place where it was prophesied that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. That's a powerful God. We're talking about a God who put a new star in the sky on the night that he was born. We're talking about a God who died on the cross but did not stay dead. What did he do three days later? He rose again from the grave. Can I tell you this morning that that when God says he's going to work all things together for your good, he will. Because incomparable majesty is at work for you. And so here's the practical application. Rest ye merry gentlemen. I love that song we just sung. God rest ye merry gentlemen. What's it say next? Let nothing you dismay. You know what God wants from us? He wants our trust incomparable majesty. Wrap your mind around the beauty of Christmas and all that it means and all that it represents. You know what what God wants us to do this morning? He wants us to take all of our worries, all of our fears, all of our troubles, all of our anxieties. He wants us to take all of our hopes, our dreams, our aspirations. He wants us to take everything that we have He wants us to go over to this manger. He wants us to wrap our minds around the fact that that God became flesh to reconcile a sinner like me. And he wants us to present all that we have and lay it at his feet in worship. Gold represents incomparable majesty. What else did the wise men bring to Jesus when they saw him? They didn't just bring gold. They also brought what's next? Frankincense. Anybody know what frankincense is? I'm trying to get it out here. Uh oh, got all twisted up. Frankincense is 100% natural gum tree sap. That's what this is right here. It's still something that's widely used in the Middle East even into this day. And when you take this, it feels like hard little pebbles. You would never know that this is sap. But when you take these pebbles and you break them down or you crush them into power and then you burn them, it lets off a very fragrant and aromatic smell. And the the beauty of frankincense is, is that it was closely associated with ceremonial worship of a deity in those times. Again, the wise men knew that they were going to a king. They knew they were going to the king of kings and lord of lords. And you know what this frankincense represents? Unshakable worship. Unshakable worship. God wants our worship. He wants our praise, and he's given us a foundation and a security that makes our worship unshakable. This promise that we're looking at, his call, all that we have in Christ, it's based on a foundation and a security that is absolutely unshakable. Look at how all this plays out. At the end of verse 28, it says that the promise all things will work together for good is to them who love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. And then in verse 29, he explains a little bit about what his purpose is. Everybody look at verse 29. It says, first of all, for whom he did foreknow. You know what that word foreknow means? To know beforehand. Now, I believe that God's omniscient. He knows all things, and he knows everybody who is going to accept or reject his call. How many of you believe that about God? He is omniscient in all of his ways. But this calls a little bit, I mean, his foreknowledge is a little bit more personal because when God knows somebody, he knows you in a personal and intimate way. And it says, moreover, whom he did foreknow. The word here means to befriend or to be acquainted with someone in a familiar way ahead of time or before meeting them. God already knew us in a personal and intimate way long before he ever met us, before we were born, before we even answered his call. Guess what? God was working in a supernatural way to bring us away to salvation, to already begin to work all things together for our good. Then it says, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. You know what that word predestinate means? To determine something ahead of time or before its occurrence. Guess what? Christmas was God's idea. 
Christmas was not something that was created or invented by man. Christmas was God's idea. And before he ever made us, think about this this morning. Any of you got problems in your life? Any of you ever messed up before? I got any sinners in here? Okay, you don't have to raise your hand or admit this one, but how many of you, if you're being honest, when you look at your own life, you're like, oh my goodness, I have done a lot of really crazy things and made a big mess out of stuff I didn't need to do. Okay, put your hands up. That's all of us, all right? (laughs) You understand what I'm saying? He predestined. Knowing who we are, Knowing who he would, we would be, he determined, he decreed ahead of time that he would send his son to reconcile us. But it gets even better than that because it says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. His plan is not just to, to restore a right relationship, but it's to turn us with all of our problems and all of our brokenness into a person that's like Jesus. Now, how many of you are sitting here thinking, that feels absolutely impossible and way out of the level of what I will ever be in my life? (laughs) If we're being honest, that, 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 I mean, wow, to to think that that's what he gave his life for. But you know what he says at the end of that verse? That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus was the first man ever to die and rise again by his own power. He was the first man to ever live a perfect life, go to a cross, die, pay the penalty for sin, and then rise again from the grave. And because he rose again from the grave, when we believe in him, we die, our old sinful nature dies, and we become a new creation in Christ. And the fact that no matter how impossible it feels that we could ever be like him, we have that resurrection power at work in our lives that is transforming us. And just as certainly as he defeated death, when we die, we're going to step into the presence. And when we see him, we will be like him when we see him face to face. Wow. Wow. That's what God predestined for us before the foundation of the earth. And then look what he says next. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. I got to just talk about this again one more time. He's calling. Today he's calling sinners. If you don't know for sure that you have a relationship with God, he's calling. The truth of the gospel is going out. You're a sinner and you need a savior. And the only hope that you have is to put your faith and trust in Jesus and what he did for you on the cross. And when the gospel call goes out in the power of the Holy Spirit, God is powerful enough and strong enough to open up your eyes, to help you to see your need of a savior. Please, if that's you, respond to that call today. (laughs) Here's the practical application from all of this. Sing what he's done. Man, we just got done singing that song. I love that song. What he's done. Okay, I'm not going to do that. I was going back and forth if I should try to sing, but that did not come out how I wanted it to. But what he's done, what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the son. And then what do we sing? My sins are forgiven. Help me out here. My future is heaven. I praise God. For what he's done. One more time. What he's done. What he's done. All the glory and the honor to the Son. Now sing it with heart. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. You know that that's based on the truth of what we're looking at right here? Look at how that ends. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you were declared righteous in spite of your sin and your brokenness. God, our Father, no longer sees that. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and his righteousness was passed on to us. And not only are our sins forgiven, we don't have to walk around in guilt and condemnation. We are set free to walk in newness of life because we are justified. And then he justified, he also glorified. And what I love about that verse, that word glorified, it's in the past tense. And our glorification is so certain that Paul's already talking about it like it's done. Because the moment that we believe, the work of transformation has already started in our life. But one day, our future is heaven. And in heaven, we're going to have new bodies. And we're going to live on a new earth forever, just like Jesus conformed to the image of his son. You know what God wants from us? He wants our worship. And he wants our praise. And as we go into Christmas Day... Man, the culmination of everything that we're talking about. 
ought to result in unshakable worship. And we ought to walk over here and gaze at the birth of God's son in the manger. And we ought to offer him all of our praise and all of our worship and all of our adoration because he has done great and mighty things. And whether or not things are broken in your life, that does not matter. That's not what the Christmas spirit is all about. The Christmas spirit is all about the fact that all things will work together for good and none greater and none better than the day that we stand in the presence of God for all of eternity made perfect like his son, Jesus Christ. So sing what he's done. And last but not least, we've already had gold and frankincense, but wait, there's... How'd you like that joke right there, guys? (sighs) Another one I was debating, but I couldn't pass up on the dad joke today. And I know my family's going to roast me for that later, but it was worth it. That was a good one. Someone sent me that yesterday, and I was like, I got to put that in the message tomorrow. (sighs) There's myrrh. Okay, but this is very serious, so get the laughter out of your head and get zoned in, because we're going to wrap this all up. Myrrh, it's a fragrant spice derived from the sap of a tree. It's native to the Near East. In the ancient world, it was used as a perfume or an anointing oil. And one of the most amazing things about myrrh was that it was a key ingredient, the mixture of spices, in the mixture of spices that was used for burial. And when we're talking about myrrh this morning, we are talking about un imaginable sacrifice unimaginable sacrifice look how this passage ends what shall we say then to these things <laughs> what can we say we know that all things will work together what can we say then to these things how is it possible to put magnificent truth like this into words and yet we still must try We still must do our best that we can to describe the unspeakable gift that God has given to us. What shall we say then to these things? And then what's he say? Everybody read it out loud with me. If God be for us, who can be against us? Man, let that, if God be for us, who can be against us? No one, nothing. If God is for you, no one can successfully be against you. Even the things that Satan means for our destruction and for our evil, God turns it around and uses it for his good. If God is for you, no one, nothing, not anything at all can ever successfully be against you. And here's why. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. When you fast forward from the birth of Jesus to the death of Jesus, you'll find a man by the name of Judas, one of Jesus' closest friends, one of his most trusted men that traveled with him, one of his most trusted disciples. He was given the purse. He was given all of the money. He betrays Jesus. You know what he did? He gave Jesus up. A little bit later, he's standing before Pilate. And what's Pilate do? Pilate washes his hands clean, and he gives Jesus up over to the people. Man, you know what the people do? You know what the religious leaders do? You know what the Bible tells us? That that we were part of that crowd. It was our sins that put him there. You know what we did? In the heart of who we are, in our most broken, selfish state, we don't like God. We don't like his authority. We don't like him telling us what to do. And you know what we did? We cried out, crucify him. We gave him up to the cross. You know what Jesus did? He went silently as a lamb to the slaughter. He willingly gave himself up out of love. But you know what the overriding, overarching truth in all of this is? This only happened. The only reason why we gave him up was because God, first and foremost, before any of us did, he gave up his own son. You want to talk about a great love for God so loved the world? You're talking about a perfect, pure, most innocent love that he had for his only begotten son, and he gave up his own son. To go to a cross and die. He gave up his own son to be betrayed by a friend. He gave up his own son to be beaten 39 times where the skin and the flesh of his back was just falling apart. 
He gave up his own son to be mocked. He gave up his son to have that crown of thorns put into his head. He was spit upon. His beard was plucked out of his face. He was led to a cross. He was laid on the ground. Nails were put into his hands and into his feet. They lifted him up on a cross. That cross thudded into the ground with a force that had to just shake him and jar him to the core. And for hours, he suffered and he bled and he died the most agonizing, excruciating death that you could ever possibly imagine on a cross in a cruel and horrific way, all because God, his father, spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. And then he says this, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If God did the hard, unimaginably hard thing in giving up his own son to that type of a death, How certain can we be that he will do the easy thing of giving us all things? The only response that I think that we can have to that unimaginable sacrifice is to fall on your knees. He died so that we could have life. And the greatest, most fitting response that we can have as we go through the Christmas season It's to come here to the manger, to get on our knees in awe and wonder that a perfect, holy, righteous God would love us in all of our sin and brokenness. I know that there's a lot of awesome things that's going to happen over the next 24 hours. I know we've got family traditions. I know the kids are excited about opening their gifts. But shame on us if all that Christmas is, is the lights and the trees and the presents and the family and the good times and the memories. Fall on your knees. We're talking about a God that wants to do unspeakable, unimaginable things in our life. He wants to work all things together for your good. And he gave us his own son to prove it to us. And shame on us if we go through life worried and stressed out and fearful and anxious when we have a God who says it's all going to work together for our good. That's a truth and that's a certainty that no man can ever rob and ever steal from us.